Good evening, everybody. And welcome to uh, Mexborough and Swinton Astronomical Society. This evening, we have the pleasure in inviting, or we've had the pleasure of inviting Sue Parr to um, speak a few words of wisdom. So I'm told. <laughs> so Sue, Sue's a retired teacher and worked for many years with young people in music making in a voluntary capacity. Her interest in astronomy started whilst in the Brownies, <coughs> excuse me, when Brown Owl pointed out Orion's belt. She's been a member of the Cleethorpes and District Astronomical Society for many years and is its secretary. She's also part of the outreach team, is coordinator of the informal evenings and gives presentations to the beginners group. Always worthwhile. Sue finds every aspect of astronomy fascinating, but her leanings are towards the characters who helped found astronomy as we know it today, observing if the sky is clear and the solar system. So please all put your hands together and welcome Supa. Thank you. Off you go. I'll share my screen now. Right. And it, as Steve said, I'm Sue Parr, and my interest in astronomy started when Brown Owl took us outside one night and saw Orion's belt. I can remember exactly where I was when I saw it, and it affected me. Now, unfortunately, life got in the way, and I had a career and children, and as previously mentioned, I, um, I had a family and I'm involved with music because my two girls were involved with music. So astronomy had to put go on the back burner a bit. But we were always interested in it and we do always do things like go and look at the eclipse and other things like that. Now, and in my re retirement, astronomy seems to have taken over a little bit. Well, David or my husband will say probably more than that, but I'm enjoying it and he's enjoying what he's doing with astronomy too. And before I start, I must say one thing. I have a huge problem with numbers. I can add up numbers faster than David, who is actually sitting beside me now, but there's some confusion in my brain between seeing the number on the page and actually getting it out of my mouth. So in the presentation, if there is a date, this, I usually put it on the presentation. So follow the presentation number, not necessarily what comes out of my mouth. I do try very hard. And after three errors, David will give me a nudge to say, just get yourself under control again, so. Right, now down to astronomers by chance. It's a talk and a look and a snapshot into astronomers who have come by discoveries by chance, who have actually changed their careers midstream and had an extremely successful life in astronomy. Now, for thousands of years, humankind have looked at the sky. They must have done this, although there is no written evidence of that has been looking at the sky for or thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. But you have to get the evidence to prove that they did this. Now, the first one is, you go to France to the Dordogne and this area, Abbey Blanchard. Now, you have to go back to 30,000 BCE when the Desres was this fantastic cave. You did everything in the cave. You lived, you slept, I presume you ate as well, and you did other things. Goodness knows when, whether it was at night, whether it was during the day, or whether it's in the sun. You had to make your implements to, in order to live. And at the back of this cave in Abbey Blanchard been found all these artifacts. And the one we're particularly interested in tonight is this one. 
this one, it's only 10 centimeters along. And it was found, and when it was, in, <coughs> when it was initially found, it was just thought to be some markings on the, um, on the stone. But then, of course, the experts come in and then they realize that maybe this is something more than just a pattern. And the experts decided that the pattern was the lunar cycle. Now, I have read and reread several times the explanation from this, but unfortunately, my brain won't seem to take in what they're all saying. But the experts, and I mean the top experts, have decided that this is the lunar pattern. This is a lunar cycle. Now, was this done by chance? I think it probably was. Maybe they had taken notice of the moon and they were realizing that there was a cycle in it and they then decided to, to mark it. Or were they just, did they just like the fact that this is what the moon did? And then they wrote it, but they screwed, um, chiseled it out. But whether it was by chance or not, they became astronomers. Whichever way you look, here, patterns. Now, I'm just gonna move on a little bit. That's where we were. Now we're going to go a little bit further north, but we're going to go on until 1940, because in 1940, this man, Marcel, and his dog, Robot, were out walking, and then suddenly the dog disappeared, and the dog had fallen down a cave. And Marcel went to have a look and see what was happening, and he was absolutely astounded what he saw in the cave where the dog was. And he immediately got his friends to come. That's Marcel there and his three friends. They went down the cave. And what they had discovered was the Lascaux Caves. Now, the experts immediately came in and they reckoned that it was the, the walls were painted in. 15,000 BCE or thereabouts. Now, everybody's seen pictures of the Lascaux Caves. Um, it's scenes of hunting, and they think there's probably uh, a comet as well there. But a particular interest tonight, and for astronomers, is this one here. It's just a bull. But you look here, these bits here, they're they, experts say are the Pleiades. And here um, is Orion, and you can see all the other the stars in the constellations around there. So they were drawing. Now, we don't know why they were drawing. Maybe they just liked them, and it was a story time because of, we know that the um, people years ago used the sky for stories and maybe they were just drawing the illustrating a story that they knew. Um, we don't know but was that by chance that they put them up but whether it's by chance by chance or not they actually became astronomers because they were observing the sky. We've got to move on to 2004 and Scotland was having an aerial survey and in 2004 it was particularly dry and when they got their photographs home or oh, they were in this area and when they got their photographs back they found this one and this one here and they realize here it's got all the um, marks in it. So this immediately got the experts and the archaeologists interested. And so they went down and had a look and this was in a place called Warren Field. And as you can see here, this is where the people are standing there, see the distance apart. And the experts reckoned that, using the post holes, that 
it was built about 8,000 BCE. Now, what they found extremely interesting was that if you looked at the post holes, these holes here where the um, post holes for stones or for trees, you looked at the back and you could act over the hills and where the moon would be, you've actually got a lunar calendar. But what they had very cleverly done was added another hole there to make up for the time that it wasn't the lunar cycle isn't the same as the sun cycle. Now this one again needs an expert more clever than myself to actually explain properly but all I can tell you is and I'm happy telling you that the experts say that is a lunar calendar down the bottom here. Now, did they do it by chance? How did they find this out? We don't know, but it's nice to think it was by chance that they then got a lunar calendar and they were also thinking about time, which is so important in our astronomy. Now, for years, thousands of years, people have realised there is a cycle in the year when the rivers flood, when the berries come, when the certain animals migrate. And however that was by chance, they made stone circles. We know that we've got a lot here they, in, in England, in Britain, particularly Stonehenge. But how did they come across putting a stone up to show you things. Did they have a stone that they put in the middle of a field somewhere to remember something? And then realized that there was, um, the, when the sun shone, it changed the shadow. We don't know, but it's perhaps by chance. Now, stone circles aren't just prevalent in Europe. And one of the earliest ones is this one. Um, Shall I let Sandra in? Paul? I've got it, thank you. Uh, it's just across the top, that's all. Um, this is Napta Player. This actually is in Africa and it's been found down there. There's Egypt, here we are, Africa, and it's here. Now, it was built originally 5000 BCE and it looks like this now. Now this isn't the actual um, stone circle because it's too far out for people to go and see so they've actually built. You can see there's a stone circle which can be used, they have found, as a calendar for the solar year and for the lunar year. Now just as a sidestep, we go to Senegambia. Now, Senegambia, you may know, is in Africa and it's in this area here. And there are some stone circles, but they were only constructed, they were built, the 300 BCE to 1600 AD. They're much more modern, but there they are. They look exactly the same as stones, uh, stone circles that were built thousands of years ago. And they show the same things, the lunar cycle and the solar cycle. Now let's move on to 3000 BCE. And to take you up to Scotland, to Callanish. Now, some of you may have been there. Uh, David and I had the good fortune of going up there, and it's quite an impressive place. You have the stones made into a circle, and it's an unusual shape because it's crucifix, and um, there's the avenues. Now, what 
the experts get excited about is the fact that if you look here to the sunset, the moon and the sun sort of flirt across the top of those um, hills there. And using the stones, because we couldn't actually prove it or see it because we weren't there at the right time, it flirts across and it follows, using the circle and the stones, the 18-year cycle of the moon. Now, did they do this by chance? Now, there are those skeptics who say, wherever you put a sewn circle, you're going to find something like that. But I don't think so. I think they did it and then they, they found it. And it, so it was, useful, it was useful to them. And so they found it by chance. Now, I have had to slip this one in because I'm quite excited about it. It was, this is the Nebrat's bronze disc. It's found in Germany and it is dated at 16, now do I mean, I don't mean that, do I mean, what do I mean? <laughs> one, one, 1600 BCE, it's 30 centimetres across and it shows the sun or the moon. And still not 100% sure. There's a bit here, there's a sunrise and the sunset, and this bit here they think can be the sun moving across the sky. And there's the, the stars as well. And in there, that's Pleiades. Now, why did they do this? Or have they now become astronomers by chance? Was it some uh, leader wanted something special and so said, to the sky, and that's what come. That is what's come, and it's quite big. It's thirty centimeters, and there's a picture here. Now, at the moment, it should be on its way or being packed to come over here, and that's why I'm saying it now. If you're interested, there is an ex exhibition at the British Museum when this will be shown. And I'm quite excited because we've got tickets to go and see it, actually see this. But this, that's quite, I just had to throw that in if you are interested in things way, way back. Now, let's move on to named people. The early Greek philosophers. Philo means love and Sophia means wisdom. So the word philosophy really means the love of wisdom. So basically, philosophy is thinking about the world and making sense out of it. And this is what these early Greek philosophers were trying to do. And they came across things quite by chance. This you may recognise as being Pythagoras. And he was around and born about 570 BC. We all know Pythagoras for his theorem. Square on the hypotenuse is equal to the addition, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the opposite side. Now he wasn't only a mathematician, but maybe through chance and by looking up at eclipses, realized that the earth was a sphere. That's perhaps by chance because he was mainly a mathematician. And if you look up uh, Pythagoras, it usually says Pythagoras, the mathematician. So perhaps by chance. And by looking up as well, he was the one who realized that Venus was both the morning star and the evening star. That must have been by chance that he saw that. And in his wish to find out more about the world and making sense of it. Now, this is Aristarchus. He was born about 315 BCE. Now, he was a mathematician primarily, but then put his mathematician's brain to work to try and find the relative sizes of the sun, earth and moon. And through this diagram, that's what, how he worked it out. Unfortunately, 
he worked it out that the distance from the sun from the distance from the earth to the sun was 19 times more than the distance from the earth to the moon now and that is terribly wrong because it's 300 and something times 390 times i think it is but unfortunately the instruments he was using weren't quite accurate what he was doing was absolutely correct but he just had the wrong numbers to start off with. And also he is the one who first muted the point that we were living in a heliocentric universe. Here we are. Here's, that, that obviously is not to scale. But he was laughed out of the house. He, no, that was absolute rubbish. That couldn't be at all. But maybe by chance and chance he had found these things. And this is Ptolemy. He was born about 140 AD. He was a polymath, if ever there was one. Um, his contributions to geography, geography musical theory, optics, mathematics, including established that that an object and its mirror image must make equal angles to a mirror. Now, David did explain to me what that last bit was, and I understood it last night, but don't ask me to explain it tonight because it's just gone straight out of my head. Now, he was interested in lots of things, and one of the things was his Almagest, and he was prolific in everything he did, astronomy as well. And it was a series of 13 books and in it he explained his theory uh, his theories about the stars the distances and he did a perfect um, map of the sky which was used for another thousand years but we also know Ptolemy for his idea of a geocentric world here it is and he overcame this business of the planets, which have retrograde mu movement, by having them in le little epicycles. But he did this, found this by chance, because that's what he wanted to do as a philosopher. He wanted to find out the truth. Apart from the fact his geocentric world was not the truth, it doesn't really matter. He was trying, he was looking. Now, we move on a little bit now to another named person. This you will recognize as Nicholas Copernicus. He was born in 1473. Now I'll just get rid of him for the moment and just put him in the corner so he can oversee part of his life, particularly the early part of it. Now, he was born in Poland, born in a place there called Turun. And he was from a merchant family. His father was a merchant. So there's quite a bit of money there. And he had three sisters. Now, oops, sorry, wrong way. Well, I do apologize. I am pressing the right switch here. Click. There we go. And it's him. Did he wrongly? I do apologize. Let's turn around. When his father died, and Uncle Lucas took over his education. And he must have realized he was quite a bright man because he put a lot of effort into Copernicus's early education and later life. He sent him down a bit further south to this place. I will not embarrass myself by saying the name of the town. Just read it yourself, please, because I don't speak Polish, so I have no idea how to say that correctly. This brought Copernicus up to the level that he could then go to Krakow University. And this is the idea, it was to study canon law. Now, when he'd finished his two years at Krakow, he hadn't got any qualifications, 
but that didn't particularly bother Uncle Lucas because by then Uncle Lucas had moved up to Warmia, which is an area in Poland. And that's one of the places it's on, on the coast in Warmia. Now, his uncle wanted him to with canon law because by now um, Uncle Lucas had got himself quite high in the church. So he sent him to Bologna, canon law. And while he was there, he had a visit to Rome as well. So this is quite a well-travelled young man. Now when he finished there, Uncle sent him back to Warmia. Now, Next thing, notice there's no mention of astronomy at all. He sent him to Padua. He sent him to Padua because he wanted him to be a doctor, a physician. And then when he had got his qualification as a physician, he came back to Frombach, which is a place in Warmia. And then while he was there, he, I uh, have to read the list of things that he was while he was there working uh, for his uncle. He was a mathematician, he was a physician, he was a classic scholar and a translator. This bit that I put up there, that picture is of his translation from Greek to Latin. Yes, he did that at night, just something to do. He acted as a governor. He was a diplomat, he was an economist too. And if you're an economist, you know of the Gresham Law, that he was one of the people who started the Gresham Law. Now, apart from those things, he did have a love life. This was really frowned upon because he was working in the church, but he had a live-in housekeeper and a shilling. So we'll just get rid of her because it was frowned upon. And then Copernicus put his energies into looking at the sky. And in 1514, he wrote a little commentary, which was his ideas about how the universe was and that it's, uh, we were living in a heliocentric world. To that, he put a lot of his energy in looking at the sky and working out, here it is, with his pen, working hard. And so much so that in 1532, he wrote and produced on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, which he realised then that we were living in a heliocentric world. Now, at that time, the church was very, very high in the world and it made all the rules. So he did show it to Pope Paul III, who thought it was quite an interesting work, so nothing was said against it. Now, he worked at it and worked at it until in 1543, he did have his On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Sphere produced. Now, sadly for Copernicus, he had a heart attack and was very ill. And he hadn't actually, he was, this is, he was in, be, in his bed, and he hadn't actually seen his work printed. So his book was brought to him. And so the story goes, he saw his book in print and then sadly died. Now, because he was a, just a, we say, a lowly, um, canon he wasn't anything special he just got really like a pauper's um grave 
but it was later thought that this wasn't right. And so a better, much better um, gravestone was given to him. It was recognised. So here we have Copernicus. He was a polygot, a polymath, a mathematician, a physician, a classic scholar, a translator, a governor, a diplomat, and an economist. An economist, and was then an astronomer. It was just by chance. It was just he got something else to do. He got a lot of mental capacity. I wonder what he would have been like now. Is he would have he been the equivalent to our uh, Stephen Hawking or somebody? I don't know. And there is a statue to him. And he was the founder of our modern astronomy. This was a man who didn't really take up astronomy, but just by chance later on in his life. You'll all <coughs> recognise this as being Galileo. This is his name in Italian, Galileo de Vincenzo Bonaniti de Galilei. Galilei. And he was born in 1564. He was born in Pisa. And he came from a wealthy family and he went to the university. Originally, he went to the university to be a physician, but then realised there wasn't sufficient money in that, so he changed it to being a scientist. And whilst he was there, he obviously proved his worth and was given a professorship or whatever they called it in those days, in Pisa and then in Padua. Then he moved back to Pisa, Pisa, where he did more of his scientific experiments. And that's what he was employed as a mathematician and a scientist, no mention of astronomy. Just a little sidestep. This is Hans Lippershe. Now, I'd looked at Lippershe in several different um, sites. And you can have Hans Lippershe with an S in, or you can have Hans Lippershe, so take your pick. He was born in 1570 in Wesel in Germany. And then when he was quite young, his family moved to Middleburg in the Netherlands. And it was while he was there, in Middleburg, that he became a master lens grinder and a spectacle maker. And then in 1608, he painted something that for seeing things far away as if they were nearby, he painted a telescope. Now, how did Galileo get to know about it? Galileo somehow managed to get a description of the telescope. He never saw the telescope at all. He just had written instructions of how the telescope worked. Now, he being the scientist and full of curiosity, asked for a shopping list. He asked for a shopping list of artillery balls, iron bowls, Tripoli powder, Greek pitch, felt, two tin organ pipes. And with that, he produced his telescope, which could see a great, far greater distance than the one that Lippershe had produced. Now, at the time, he was working for the military, amongst other things. So it came in really useful because you could see what the enemy was doing. But in 1610, which was a quite a while after he had produced his telescope, by chance, he pointed the telescope to the sky. Oh my goodness, what did he find? Another world. So much so that in 1610, 
he went to see the Doge of Venice and he wrote this letter. Now it says that he said, Galileo Galilee most humbly prostrates himself before your highness, watching carefully and with all spirit of willingness, not only to satisfy what concerns the reading of mathematics in the study of Padua, but to write of having decided to present your highness a telescope. That will be a great help in maritime and land enterprises. This is a telescope that he was pushing. I assure you, I shall keep the new invention a great secret and show it only to your highness. The telescope was made for the most accurate study of distances. This telescope has the advantage of discovering the ships of the enemy two hours before they can be seen with the natural vision. To distinguish the number and quality of the ships and to judge their strength and to be ready to chase them, to fight them, or to flee from them, or in open country to see all details and to distinguish every movement and preparation. So this is how he pushed his telescope. But what he did do was he actually at the bottom wrote some of these other findings from the sky. And this is his original um, list of the observing of Jupiter and his moons. Now he didn't only, although he was pushing the fact of this, um, this telescope, he didn't only turn to Jupiter, he turned to the moon. We all know of his ears, Saturn, Venus, Pleiades. Now what's really interesting is on December 28th, 1612, and between that and date and the 28th of January, he made this observation. And here, he actually noted that there was a star that wasn't, shouldn't have been there, and it was moving because it was in none of the other star atlases that he had seen. And what he had discovered, and nobody to this day knows whether he was aware of the fact that he discovered new, uh, he had discovered Neptune, but they assume he did. But the letter which he would sent to his friends has not been found yet. But hopefully, sometime it will be unearthed. The fact that he was the first person to notice Jupiter, yes. sorry, notice Neptune. Also that year, he wrote his Sede Eros Nuncius, Nuncius, however you want to pronounce it, Starry Messenger. This is when he published all his works. It had up to date, but that didn't stop him still studying the sky because this is his original um, observations of Jupiter. <laughs> of, yes, of Jupiter. And then, in 1613, he produced a much more orderly um, sheet of the planets. Now, because of all this, and particularly with the use of telescope for ships, for military, he was fated all over. And he, the, the um, uh, merchants of Florence wanted his telescopes, and he was just fated all over. But there's a timeline now. In 1513, it's just, it will use, sorry, so there you go. 1543, Copernicus produced on the revolutions of the hemispheres. In 1600, this poor chap, also was thinking that maybe Copernicus was right, but he was a priest, he was a monk, and because he wouldn't disagree with what he said about the um, heavens, that maybe Copernicus was right, he was actually burnt at the stake. 
in 1610, Galileo produced his Starry Messenger. In 1613, he realised that Copernicus was right. And he argued against the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church in matters of astronomy because the Roman Catholic Church was boss in more things. And then in 1615, he realised that he wasn't going to get anywhere. So he wrote another letter, less um, forceful. And the bits on here that apparently you can see there, he cut out. And having been hauled in front of the committee, he was told in 1616 to abandon his support of the Copernican model. That was it. He was not to think of it anymore. So he went home. But it still was round in his mind. He still knew that somewhere it was right. And in the dialogue concerning two chief world systems, he wrote as if Ptolemy with his geocentric vision and with Copernicus with his heliocentric vision were having a discussion. Now this really, really angered the church, who were having nothing more of this, so they brought him for an inquisition to Rome. The upshot of that was, as you will know, he was sent to prison. But they did relax it and he was put under house arrest here in Italy and he stayed there until he died. He was still able to have visitors but obviously he was under house arrest. Now in 1642 Galileo died and think this man he only by chance he put his eye to the telescope and focused the telescope on the sky and this he became the astronomer he was. And Galileo, he, I think he, he would definitely have been a Stephen Hawking because he studied speed and velocity, gravity and free fall, the principle of relativity, inertia, projectile motion, and also worked in applied science and technology, describing the properties of pendulums and hydrostatic balances, inventing the thermoscope and various military compasses, and by chance, by using the telescope for scientific observations of celestial objects. So he had a change of career halfway through, but he still, while he was in uh, exile and he was under house arrest, he still was doing his science as well. Now, one of his quotes was, curiosity is the key to problem solving. Now, when he died, some of his friends wanted him to be buried in the basilica, basilica of the Holy Cross in full view of everybody. But, because of his vehement suspicion of heres heresy, because that's what they thought, um, <clears throat> he wasn't, he was just buried in a side chapel. But in 1737, when the heliocentric world had been proved, he decided to exhume him and put, build this wonderful uh, tablet to him in the main church. But what they did as well, just show you quickly, because it's not really very nice. When they took him, they actually chopped off three of his fingers, and I think it was his to a tooth. And you can now see them. But let's put that out the way. They're in one of the museums in Florence, I think it is. Because we don't want to remember Galileo for his odd finger there. And Galileo is the father of modern astronomy as observational astronomy. And one of his quotes is, the Bible shows the way to go to heaven, but not the way the heavens go, which I think is really good. This was, he became an astronomer by chance. Now, <clears throat> you will recognize this picture portrait 
have been William Herschel. Now, William Herschel was born in 1738. He was born in Hanover. He was born Wilhelm Herschel. And he came from a musical family and his father encouraged him and his brother to play the organ, the violin, the oboe and the piano. It was a harpsichord, I'm sorry, it was a harpsichord. Now, in 15... No. In 1755, he came to England. He came to England with a Hanoverian guard to look after George the George III. Now, he was then, then at the time when Napoleon was showing his force over in Germany and in that area, so he had to go back. And then in 1757, he came back to England to have a post for music in the church in Sunderland. Then moved to Newcastle. He then went to Darlington. He moved on to Leeds. He went to Halifax. All good northern towns that he went to. But in 1766, he took a post at the Octagon Chapel in Bath. And it was there. He lived at 19 King Street, which you now know is the Herschel Museum. And in this period, up to then, he'd written 24 symphonies, many concertos, and lots of church music. He was a very busy man. Then, in 1772, I know no mention of astronomy, he was reunited with his sister, Caroline. Now, Caroline had been born in 1750. She was, there were five brothers, I think it was, and herself. Now, sadly, when she was about eight, nine, she contacted typhus and that stunted her growth. And she had, she had smallpox as well and had a um, terrible complexion on her face. Now, her mother uh, was very derogatory towards her, said that she was no good because she was four foot six. She'd be no good other than being a housekeeper. So let's keep you as a housekeeper and you can look after the brothers and you can look after the house. Now, William also knew of this problem, so he asked her to come over to England to be his housekeeper. Now, this is the picture of the house as it is today, perhaps not quite as it was in their day, but you can see from the size of it, he did need somebody to look after the house. And he asked Caroline to be his housekeeper and she willingly agreed. Now then, when Caroline came home, he realised that she too was a good, she had a beautiful voice. And so for some time, he took her out in concert parties and she sang and she was very, very popular. Then in 1774, he acquired this. Life changed completely. He got his first telescope. And Caroline, being his housekeeper and living with him as well, got involved too. Now, I don't know, but the first time I saw this picture, I thought, in my complete ignorance, that she had made him a cup of tea and she was doing her housekeeper duties, but she wasn't. She was giving him the water and liquid so that he could make the, uh, the lenses. She worked by his side at what he was doing. And also <clears throat> when he was using his telescope, she would sit inside, he would look outside and he would tell her what to write down, what he had been observing. So she was a real, real help to him. Then, we all know, 1781, it was a craze to look for comets and he thought he'd found a comet. And then he realized, why is the comet moving so slowly? Mm -hmm. Because 
um, a planet. He had discovered a planet and after there was a, a lot of discussion, but then it was realized that he had discovered a planet. And he too was fated as Galileo was, and he moved to Slough in 1786. This was the second house he lived in. The first house he lived in was damp, and so they moved to this one. And it was here that he got involved in making his telescopes. He first of all made his 20-foot telescope, then he made his 40-foot telescope, and these were some of the biggest telescopes around at the time, because he was really into telescope making. Now, in 1788, he met this lady, Mary Pitt, née Baldwin. Now, she was a very rich widow, and he married her, and they had a son, John. Now, this changed the life completely for Caroline, because up to then, she had looked after William, she had been his housekeeper, she had ordered his day, and suddenly that didn't happen anymore because he was married to Mary. And life got a tad awkward for her. And it was when John was six, I'll just read this, it's one of her letters, she said, my dear nephew was only in his sixth year when I came to be detached from the family circle. She seems so sad. But this did not hinder John and I from remaining the most affectionate friends. And many a half or whole holiday, he was allowed to, to be with me and was dedicated to making experiments in chemistry, where generally pepper boxes, oil boxes, tops of tea canisters and teacups served as the necessary vessels and the sand furnished the matter to be analysed. I, I only had to care to exclude water which would have produced havoc on my carpet. Her life was miserable. She could go and use the telescopes at uh, William's house, but she had to move out and she could only go to the house when Mary wasn't around. And as a sop, in 1795, William bought her her own telescope. Now, in 1822, William died, but not before he had played a huge part in developing telescopes. He found 848 double stars. He discovered Uranus and two of its moons, started study, studying sunspots. He discovered two moons of Saturn, he catalogued 2,500 objects as nebulae or star clusters. He proposed that the Milky Way was a disk. He did give asteroids their name too. And on his gravestone, it says, Chalum Peru Perupit Claustra, which means he broke through the barriers of the heavens. This was the man who had originally been a musician. It had a career change. Now in 1822, Caroline was 72. What was she to do? She wasn't happy at all. She couldn't go and use the telescopes of her brother. She decided that as she hadn't got many years left, she would go back to Hanover. But that didn't stop her being friendly and writing to John because he says that on a visit to her when she was 82, John noted, she runs about the town with me and skips up her two flights of stairs as wonderfully fresh, at least as some folks I could name who are not a fourth of her age. In the morning till 11 or 12, she's dull and weary, but as the day advances, she gains life and is quite fresh and funny. At 10 or 12 p.m., and sings old rhymes, nay, even dances, to the great delight of all those who see her. And I think she probably regretted moving back to Hanover, but she didn't think she got long to live, so she wanted to die amongst her family and not just be by herself. 
But in the meantime, because of all the work she had done, she was given the RSA Gold Award. And in 1835, she was made a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. And she actually was paid for some of the work that she did. And this, she discovered 14 nebulae, eight comets, edited the British catalogue of stars and catalogued all the discoveries of William and herself. Not bad for a lady whose mother only gave her chance to be a housekeeper. Not bad at all. Here we have William and Caroline. And there is uh, a plaque to them. He is a scientist and a musician, it's recorded. And he discovered Uranus and he also discovered infrared radiation. And his sister Caroline, an early woman scientist, doesn't actually mention her being an astronomer, but maybe because it's the Institute of Physics, that's how they see it. And she was the hunter of comets. Now, this is a quote from William Herschel. I have seen further into space than ever human being did before me. Now, that's his quote. Uh, now, I think that should be we have seen further because that's what he and his sister did because whatever he saw, she saw as well. And not bad, I don't think, for a man who was going to be a musician and somebody who was only seen to be good for being a housekeeper. And that what remains for me to say, thank you for listening to Astronomers by Chance. And if you so wish, it could be continued because there are some more surprising people who didn't start life off as astronomers to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sue. Lovely. Uh, Sue, that was an excellent, uh, talk thank you very much uh lots of things to dis to discuss with you uh the, those people <laughs> know, <laughs> they know that i've been steaming about uh, the, the brain's probably gone now <laughs> uh, uh bruno uh, and the galileo affair but uh, but there you have it uh it's question time so ladies and gentlemen uh, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to put to Sue, uh, then uh, can we have a digital hand if possible? If not, will you wave at me? I do have two screens to look at. So if you just, if you're not using uh, digital hands, just keep waving and I will catch up with you. Uh, so, uh, Mick Nichols. Right. Mick Nichols, good evening. Uh, yeah, just... Uh... <laughs> Messing around with my phone, Paul. I'm having trouble again. Um, yeah, um, you said um, Caroline Herschel had a, a miserable life. Um, well, I've done no. some research no. into Caroline Herschel myself, and um, I think her life was far from miserable because William oh. did actually look after her quite well. Now, I'm not saying that she had, I didn't actually say she had a miserable life. What I said, she was unhappy. When, yeah. when... Well, well, William did look after her. He looked after her, but she wasn't happy because she couldn't do all the things that she wanted and she wasn't uh, living her life as she had happily with, with William. I'm not saying she was miserable. I didn't say she had a miserable life. It wasn't perhaps as she would want it, but as that, that is in the research I, I have done about her, and that's 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 what it said. I'm not arguing with you as such, but I didn't say she had a miserable life. She would obviously have a happy life because of her love she had of John. There were some lovely bright sparks in her life, which made her family orientated so perhaps she wanted to be more family orientated than she was but with the arrival of Mary Baldwin um, that couldn't couldn't be but she she was she would seem she was a very lovely person but it was just the her, her 
um, life with William was changed. And so she'd had this wonderful life and then suddenly it wasn't the same as it was. But well, she seemed that, to think that. William that uh, made the King, King George III actually pay her a salary, didn't she? Yes, yes, that's what I said. Yes, she was paid. Yes. So she had a happy, had a happy life. It, she wasn't miserable. It just was not maybe what she wanted in the first place. Okay, Mick. Next sound. Thank you. Uh, Trevor Worrell. I, it's just a bit for Mick, really. I think Caroline Herschel was particularly unhappy with her life in Hanover. And once William realised uh, how she was being bullied and trapped by her mother and uh, immediate family, then that started the whole uh, domino effect where they um, had her over in the, U in the UK. Uh, I think she was quite happy once she got established uh, helping William uh, design his, uh, uh, his lenses and his mirrors and things, but it was just the fact that he, she was bullied because she wasn't the most prettiest woman, um, mm. young girl, and um, obviously William didn't want to see that, so he uh, invited her over to stay. Yeah, that's what I did. I, perhaps, perhaps I missed it out, but that was in my head to say sorry if I didn't say that, mm. but I did say that's why, well, hopefully I said that he, he invited her over because her life there wasn't very... It wasn't very good at all. Uh, there's an excellent book about uh, Caroline Herschel. I think it's called The Comet Sweeper. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it's it's well worth the read uh, if you can get hold of it. Um, I'm looking around for questions. I'm not seeing anybody at the moment. Just a comment from myself, Sue. Uh, you mentioned about Copernicus if he was alive today. Uh, mm. Would he be another uh, Stephen Hawking? Mm. I think he probably would be better than Stephen Hawking because yeah, I can, yeah. because just yeah, the way, yeah. just the way our educational system operates mm. is that you are forced to uh, you're sp forced to specialize at mm. such an early age mm. and you can see that Copernicus was a real polymath and uh, and genius mm. yeah yes he was and um yeah, and I think Galileo too would have been it, but the, but Galileo probably was he was more science bent forever, whereas Copernicus was so diverse. He was a translator. I mean, just as something to do with an evening, you translate from Greek to Latin, you know, just just because you fancy doing it. And and he was an economist. He was everything. He was such a polymath and a polyglot too because he did, he did speak other languages obviously he spoke polish and there was a latin and greek and i presume because he'd been to italy he would soon pick up the lingo there yep some people just make you sick so <laughs> they do <laughs> ian hargreaves you're still muted ian yes thank you paul uh great talk sue um really enjoyed it okay. um I noted that um, when you showed the picture of um, one of those uh, stone calendars, the um, which I think you said were they reckoned was uh, the lunar cycles. Yes. There were twelve stones in it. I yes. think. I think. Yes. And yet there are thirteen lunar cycles in one um, solar year i believe i believe i'm correct in saying that so why is it that they had 12 stones and yet they think it was a lunar calendar well i would have to pass it over <laughs> to yeah, no, the expert, no. as experts in that because i've read it and reread it and i can't particularly make sense of it. It's the same as what I was saying about the Abbey, Abbey Blanchard stone as well. The experts see it, but I will, because hopefully we'll get to, uh, come to next week's um, meeting. And if I have chance, I'll, I'll read it up again and bring it, because I, I did say to myself that if there were questions that I couldn't answer off the top of my head, yeah, I would bring it back. If I can't, I mean, I'll admit 
next week. I can't understand it. it but I will, yes. I will have a look. I will reread it again and see. Because obviously, so the more times you read things, it does um, get in your head a much better and you get a better understanding. But the, when you're doing this, when you're doing research anyway, there's a limit to how much you can understand. But I will, I will reread it again. It wasn't. And, I and wasn't, come back to you. Yes, I wasn't really questioning you about it. So I was mi- yeah. really observing it that, mm. that that was in that. I believe it was twelve that was mm. in that uh, picture of yours. In that, mm. So, that but I'll because it's interesting. It's a point to to find for to for another time, and I'll I'll look it up, read it, <laughs> I'll read it again, and see what I can see what I can come up with for you. Right. I'll the, see Ian, what I can do. Ian, so. I think the odd the odd year you do get oh, twelve oh. Uh, twelve lunar oh. lunar month uh, full moons in in a year, yeah. but it's not very often. Mm. But it does happen sometimes. But yes, it's, it's only all it was proving was the fact that they were noticing these things. They were counting they, the the full. They were counting. They were counting, and they were getting this idea of time mm. as well. The, the, they found some eagle bones in Europe as well, yeah. where they've carved notches. Yes. Uh, to represent solar, uh, uh, sorry, lunar cycles. Yes. Some, they've, they've, some of those are 12 and 13. Yeah. They've, they've found it's the same as that, the, um, the, the, lun- the, um, the lunar cycle on the Abbey Blanchard stone. It's so many other little bits and pieces involved in it too. But they have found these stones in Africa and uh, I think it's in Babylon, in that area, Mesopot- Mesopotamia. And I think somewhere I read in North America too. They found yeah. these. They found these notches. They're all over. It's really strange. This is what I find fascinating. Is the fact it's that all about counting time, isn't it? counting time, yeah. and the fact that it's all over the world. They didn't have a plane that took them from one to place to another, and they passed on the information. They're all deciding about the same time as. The humans develop, and presumably the brain and the capacity of the brain, and it's, it's all the same all the same time. I just find it absolutely fascinating. It's fascinating. I think the other, think the other yeah. thing is that we forget that we live in a um, a very nitpicky world, mm. and everything's got to be just so, and it's just got to fit in with the theory and with the equations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when we're talking about our ancestors of uh, 15,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago plus, these were pragmatic people. These were Mm. people having to deal with uh, the world as they observed it. So Mm. the way they set up these uh, calendars and things was from a pragmatic point of view. Mm. And really their, uh, their way of thinking, their way of philosophy of dealing with the world around them it's probably very different from what we how we would approach it today yeah because it's it's very self very self-centered in some respects because they've got to survive they've got to get the food they've got to do everything so everything was related to themselves as opposed to the philosophers who the greek philosophers were coming later who could think much wider yeah and and so it's all to do with them yeah. and, and their lives. And so it was useful for them to know when the, um, the, the animals were migrating, when, because it's, it was a different time scale. I mean, the animals were roaming, roaming free. And <clears throat> when the barriers would come and, this, and it was useful for them. So, and that's- so really ancient, ancient man was measuring time really on only three levels. Mm. He was measuring, the day mm. as his basic unit of time and then the lunar month and then mm. the the solar year yeah and and that's how he would mark who he would mark his time so his instruments mm. his stone circles would mm. fit into that yeah, yeah. Well, so 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 in in three in three lunar cycles we're going to be into spring and it's going to be warmer <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what it's all about that's, that's, that's what it's all about. That was, yes, that's because that's, that's all they needed. To, as it was just saying, that's all they needed to know, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, 
so that was pre uh, global warming, of course. Uh, <laughs> William S. or Bill from Cleethorpe. Uh, he said he'd ask something. Well, no, I suppose the first one is is just uh, just a, a point, and it's really, I think, picking up from what Paul was saying that um, I'm sure that these people in many cases achieved what they did in astronomy partly because they weren't astronomers to start with mm. and it was uh, it was really bringing things from their their other careers that perhaps gave them insights or made at least made them think in particular ways so uh, so that's that's one point and then the, the, the other thing I was just thinking about was that, um, yeah, the, the, obviously the calendar and measuring time and so on was very important from a, a practical point of view mm. um, in being able to, you know, hunt and, and uh, farm and so on. But then uh, the other thing that, that I think, gets brought in is that if we think about astrology when you go back astrology and astronomy were really the same thing so um, even when it was getting a little bit scientific in terms of the the astronomy as we would see it now it was still uh, still <coughs> people were you know making uh, forecasts based on the fact that they'd seen a comet or or, or even the the time of year people were born and so on so mm. i don't know that's that's maybe another area to explore so that uh, <laughs> you know, how astrologers turned into astronomers or or astronomers turned into astrologers or, or whatever. Oh, thank you Bill. I'll keep you quiet won't it for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you for that, Bill. Uh, I'm looking around for any more questions. Uh, let me have a quick scan. And I'm not seeing anybody. I think all that remains for us is to thank Supa for an excellent talk and an entertaining evening. Uh, can we give her a big Mexican Swinton Astronomical Society? Thank you. Sue, thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you.